Construction workers routinely use scaffolding during their workday. It is estimated that over 2 million workers use scaffolding on their job sites. Statistics show that every year, over 60 workers die and 4,500 are injured while either using or erecting scaffolding. These numbers clearly show a need for constant and additional training and protection for workers that use scaffolding. There are basically three types of scaffolds in use in the construction industry. Supported scaffolds, suspended scaffolds, and other scaffolds such as aerial and scissor lifts. This training program will focus on supported scaffolds and provide important information to keep you safe. The contents of this program will include definitions common to scaffolds, duties of a competent person and a qualified person, training requirements, and scaffold requirements. OSHA defines a scaffold as an elevated temporary work platform and its supporting structure, used for supporting employees or materials or both. A supported scaffold is one or more platforms supported by rigid, load-bearing members such as poles, posts, uprights, legs, frames, and outriggers. A competent person is an individual who is capable, through training and experience, of identifying existing and predictable hazards relating to scaffolds or other worksite equipment or procedures, and has the authority to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. A qualified person is an individual who possesses a recognized degree, certificate of professional standing, or has extensive knowledge, training, and experience, and therefore can resolve problems related to the work or the project. Maximum intended load of a scaffold is the total of all persons, equipment, tools, materials, transmitted loads, and other loads reasonably anticipated to be applied to the scaffold or scaffold component at any one time. A personal fall arrest system is a system used to arrest an employee's fall. It consists of an anchorage, connectors, a body harness, lanyard, deceleration device, lifeline, or combinations of these. A competent person has specific duties when it comes to scaffolds on a job site and are required to be present on all sites where scaffolding is used. They are to train employees involved in erecting, disassembling, moving, operating, repairing, maintaining, or inspecting scaffolds to recognize associated work hazards. The competent person must choose and direct the workers who erect, dismantle, move, or alter scaffolds. A competent person is to determine if it is safe for employees to work on or from a scaffold during storms or high winds. Other competent person duties include ensuring that a personal fall arrest system or windscreens protect employees and to determine the feasibility and safety of providing fall protection and access for erectors and dismantlers. The competent person must also make sure that a scaffold will be structurally sound if intermixing components from different manufacturers. One of their most important functions is inspecting the scaffolds. Scaffolds must be inspected, including scaffold components, for visible defects before each work shift and after any occurrence which could affect the scaffold. A qualified person must determine the type of scaffold needed for the job and be able to design and load scaffolds in accordance with that design. As part of the design procedure, the qualified person will determine the maximum load of the scaffold, assure a good foundation, and avoid any electrical hazards. There are two groups of workers that are associated with scaffolds those that erect and or dismantle the scaffold and those that use the scaffold for work purposes. 
OSHA requires job-specific training for both groups of employees. All pertinent training information, including dates, subject matter covered, names and times, should be documented and kept on file in a location decided upon by your employer. Employees that are responsible for assembling and disassembling the scaffolds are referred to as erectors and dismantlers. OSHA requires these individuals be trained by a competent person. Erector dismantler training includes the nature of scaffold hazards and the proper procedures for erecting, disassembling, and repairing the type of scaffold to be utilized. Training should also include design criteria, maximum intended load capacity, and intended use of the scaffold along with any other pertinent requirements. Individuals whose work requires them to be supported by the scaffolding to be able to reach elevated work areas are referred to as scaffold users. OSHA mandates that scaffold users must be trained by a qualified person. Training must enable employees to recognize the hazards associated with the type of scaffold being used and to understand the procedures to control or minimize the hazards. User training will include the nature of any hazard in the work area and the corrective actions for dealing with the hazards. Users must also be trained in the proper use of the scaffold, proper handling of materials on the scaffold, the maximum intended load, and the load carrying capacity of the scaffold and any other pertinent requirements. Employers must retrain workers when there is reason to believe that the worker lacks the necessary skills or understanding to safely erect, use, or dismantle a scaffold. OSHA specifically mandates that retraining is required in the following situations. Changes at the work site that present a hazard for which an employee has not previously been trained. Changes in the types of scaffolds, fall protection, falling object protection, or other equipment that present a hazard for which an employee has not previously been trained. Inadequacies in an affected employee's work that indicate they have not retained the initial training. The competent person and others must be on a lookout at all times to determine when retraining is necessary. There are many hazards associated with scaffolds. Injuries can occur because of a lack of training, lack of necessary equipment, improper equipment, improper use of equipment, inappropriate work behavior, or a combination of these hazards. Some possible hazardous conditions that can lead to accidents and injuries include falls from elevation due to lack of fall protection, unsafe access, and slips collapse of the scaffold due to instability, overloading, or bad planking, tools and other materials could fall from the scaffold and injure workers below. Never access a platform by climbing cross bracing. Electrocution, mainly caused by scaffold being placed too close to energized overhead lines. Remember to place scaffolds at least 10 feet away from the electric line depending on the line's voltage. Scaffolding must be built on a stable base foundation. It must be square and level. Set all scaffolds on base plates, mud sills, or another adequate firm foundation. Footings must be capable of supporting the loaded scaffold. Front end loaders and forklifts should not be used to support scaffolds unless specifically designed for such use by the manufacturer and permitted by the qualified person on the job site. Poles, frames, and uprights must be plumb and braced to prevent swaying and displacement. Use of a level is the best way to achieve the desired right angles. The integrity of the support structure of scaffolds is very important. As noted earlier, scaffolds can only be erected, moved, dismantled, and or altered under the supervision of a competent person and only by experienced and trained employees selected by the competent person. Scaffolds and their components must be capable of supporting, without failure, their own weight and at least four times their maximum intended load. Never alter a scaffold unless it is done under the approval and direction of a competent person. Frames and panels must be connected by cross, horizontal, or diagonal braces. When frames are stacked, 
cross braces must be of sufficient length as to keep the scaffold plumb level and square. All brace connections must be secured to prevent dislodging. Frames and panels must be joined together vertically by coupling or stacking pins or equivalent means and must be locked together to prevent uplift. Scaffold components made by different manufacturers or of different metals must never be utilized on the same scaffold unless approved by the competent person. Components should not be modified to make them fit together. The chances of experiencing a fall are greatest when climbing onto or off the scaffold. Safe access must be provided. Workers that erect and dismantle scaffolds are at an even greater risk because the scaffold is not complete and secure when they are performing their work. There are many different forms of access that can be utilized. Ladders such as portable, hook-on, attachable, and stairway, stair towers, ramps and walkways, integral prefabricated frames, and direct access from another surface. Workers must be able to safely access any level of a scaffold that is two feet above or below an access point. Never climb the crossbars to gain access to the scaffold. Direct access to or from another surface is only permitted when the scaffold is not more than 14 inches horizontally and not more than 24 inches vertically from the other surface. The type of scaffold access needed will determine the appropriate guardrails, rest platforms, stair rails, handrails, cleats, and other safety measures. A competent person will determine the safety and feasibility of installing and using the safe means of access based on site conditions and the scaffold type. A fall is the number one hazard when working with scaffolds. Fall protection must be used on any scaffold 10 feet or more above a lower level. Fall protection can consist of a personal fall arrest system or a guardrail system and must meet OSHA standards. Personal fall arrest systems used on scaffolds must be attached by lanyard to a vertical lifeline, horizontal lifeline, or scaffold structural member designed for the tie-off anchor. Vertical lifelines must be fastened to a fixed safe anchorage point, not part of the scaffold, and be protected from sharp edges and abrasions. Never attach vertical lifelines to each other or to the same anchorage point. Horizontal lifelines must be secured to two or more structural members of the scaffold. Guardrail systems must be installed along all open sides and ends of platforms and must be completed before the scaffold is allowed to be used by workers other than the erection dismantling workers. Walkways within the scaffold must have guardrail systems installed within nine and a half inches of and along at least one side of the walkway. The top rail must be able to withstand a force of at least 200 pounds applied, either downward or horizontally, at any point along its top edge. The top edge height of top rails must be between 38 and 45 inches. Mid rails, screens, mesh, intermediate vertical members, and solid panels must be able to withstand a force of at least 150 pounds applied in any downward or horizontal direction at any point along the mid rail or other support member. Mid rails must be installed at a height approximately midway between the top edge of the guardrail system and platform surface. If utilized, screens and mesh must extend from the top edge of the guardrail system to the scaffold platform and along the entire opening between supports. Intermediate members, such as balusters or additional rails, must not be more than 19 inches apart. Guardrails should have a smooth surface and not create a puncture or laceration hazard. End rails should not extend beyond their terminal post. Cross bracing may serve as a top rail or mid rail, providing the crossing point is between 20 and 30 inches above the work platform for a mid rail, or between 38 and 48 inches above the work platform for a top rail. When feasible, safe, and practical, fall protection for workers erecting or dismantling scaffolding must be provided. The competent person is responsible for determining the safety and feasibility of the fall protection required. The platform is the work area of the scaffold, except when it is only used as a walkway. 
Inspections of the scaffold platform must include safety checks of both the platform structure and how the platform is used by the workers. Each platform must be fully planked or decked between the front uprights and the guardrail supports. Scaffold planking must be able to support, without failure, its own weight and at least four times the intended load. Planks can be properly sized and sawn wood. Prefabricated planks or fabricated platforms may be used as scaffold planks and platforms as long as they are manufacturer approved or have been accepted by a lumber grading association or inspection agency. No gaps greater than one inch are permitted between adjacent planks or deck units or between the platform and the uprights. Gaps may be larger if it can be demonstrated that a wider space is necessary. The maximum width of a gap is nine and one half inches. Platform edges may be marked for identification purposes only. Wooden planking cannot be covered with opaque finishes. Platforms and walkways must be at least 18 inches wide. In areas that are so narrow that they must be less than 18 inches wide, fall protection must be provided and used. Do not allow items such as tools, scrap, or material to accumulate on the platform and become a slip, trip, or fall hazard. When moving platforms to the next level, the existing platform must be left undisturbed until the new end frames have been set in place and braced. There should not be more than a 14 inch gap between the scaffold platform and the structure being worked on. An 18 inch gap is permitted for lathing and plastering and masonry work only. To prevent slippage, platforms must be cleated or restrained at each end or overlap centerline support by at least six inches. Generally, each end of a platform may not extend over its support more than 12 inches for platforms which are 10 feet or shorter in length or more than 18 inches for platforms which are more than 10 feet long. On scaffolds where platforms are overlapped to create a long platform, the overlap may only occur over supports and may not be less than 12 inches unless the platforms are restrained to prevent movement. On scaffolds where platforms are abutted to create a long platform, each abutted end must rest on a separate support surface. When platforms must overlap because the scaffold changes direction, platforms that rest on a bearer at an angle other than a right angle shall be laid first and platforms that rest at right angles over the same bearer shall be laid second on top of the first platform. A platform must be able to support its own weight plus four times the maximum intended load. Never load the scaffold or any part thereof beyond the maximum intended load. A scaffold can be commonly overloaded by too many workers on the platform, too much material on the platform, or too much load concentrated in one area or point. To protect employees that work on scaffolds, certain steps must be taken. Workers should always wear hard hats. Scaffolds should have tow boards, screens, or guardrail system debris nets to keep objects from falling to lower levels. Canopy structures can be utilized where practical. Store materials and place objects away from the edge of the surface from which they may fall. Workers working below the scaffold must also be protected by barricading the area to keep them out of danger and must be used when objects could fall from the scaffold that are too heavy to be stopped by other protective means. Install tow boards along the edge of platforms that are more than 10 feet above lower levels. Tow boards must be able to withstand a force of at least 50 pounds applied in any downward or horizontal direction at any point along the tow board and be at least three and one half inches from the top edge to the level of the walking, working surface. The use of paneling or screening, a guardrail system, a canopy structure, debris net, or catch platform can protect workers that are working on lower levels. Scaffolds must remain upright to be safe and useful. As a general rule, a scaffold becomes inherently unstable once its height is four times its minimum base dimension. Weather and damage to structural components can also affect the stability of a scaffold. When a scaffold reaches a height that is more than four times its minimum base dimension, it must be restrained by guys, 
ties, or braces to prevent it from tipping. Scaffolds must be inspected for visible defects before each shift by a competent person and after any event that could affect a scaffold's integrity. Any part of a scaffold that has been damaged or weakened must be repaired, replaced, braced, or removed from service so that OSHA strength requirements are met. Scaffolds cannot be moved horizontally while workers are on them unless specifically designed for such purpose. Workers should not work on or from a scaffold during storms or strong winds unless it is determined to be safe by the competent person and the workers are protected by either personal fall arrest systems or wind screens. Scaffolds are usually made of metal and are built upward to reach elevated work areas. Electrical lines are often present overhead. The combination of both can be very dangerous and can put workers at risk of electrocution. Proper clearance and following basic rules can help eliminate the risk. Scaffolds should be constructed so that there is at least 10 feet between it and any power line. This 10-foot distance applies to any part of the scaffold and tools, equipment, or material that might be used on the scaffold. As a general precaution, the 10-foot rule should always be applied. Voltages over 50 kilovolt require distances greater than 10 feet. Scaffolds can only be closer to overhead power lines if such proximity is necessary for the type of work being performed and if the power company or electrical system operator has been notified and has either de-energized the lines, relocated the lines, or installed protective coverings over the lines to prevent accidental contact with the lines. Portable electrical equipment such as tools, cord sets, and generators can pose a serious electrical hazard for workers on or around scaffolds. If the electrical equipment develops a short, the entire scaffold metal frame and components can become energized. All portable electric equipment must be protected by GFCIs or an Assured Equipment Grounding Conductor Program. A worker that receives a shock will often lose their balance and suffer a fall. Fall protection should be utilized by workers that use portable electrical equipment on scaffolds. Scaffolds will continue to be used on construction sites and will continue to pose hazards. Never take a scaffold for granted. Always follow the scaffold manufacturer's rules and your company's regulations. If you see an unsafe condition on or near a scaffold, always report it to your supervisor. By doing so, you can be a proactive member of the team, the team that prevents injuries.